uh, we have our first question from Juan. Thank you for uh, sending in another question. We, I remember hearing from you last week. Um, so Juan wants to know if the study is longitudinal since Think Jeannie went out. For a bit. Did we lose Jeannie? Yeah. Oops. <laughs> That's all right. I can I can take over. Um, well, let me start by once again thanking you, Adelis. That was a really really fantastic presentation, uh, and I'll pick up from where Jeannie left off on the question from Juan, who is asking if the study was longitudinal because the uh, sample sizes changed between each range of days that you were showing. So if I'm back. Oh. <laughs> yeah, sorry. <laughs> we all face internet problems, right? Um, I think that this question actually is like, why are there different numbers of patients? Like, because it's not the same. Numbers. It's not. And because they're looking at, they're asking different questions. So in that first figure that I showed you where they're just looking at the presence or the detectable amounts of antibodies, they're looking just to see if all of the 285 patients, if they're able to see if they have IgM or IgG antibodies. Now, out of those patients, you can't really look at when uh, the time course of the production of the antibodies. So they then took out data sets where they have multiple serum samples. So about 200 of the patients, they only had one blood sample from the patient that they're able to analyze from. And from that one sample, you can only see, oh, I see IgM, oh, I see IgG, and they use that in a particular um, graph. Um, in the other data sets where they're looking at from being negative for certain antibodies to being positive, they can only use the ones that they have multiple serum samples. So yes, the, the samples differ based on the questions that they were trying to ask. I think that well, thanks. That and o Odellis, I can, hear you, I can hear your Blue Jays in your backyard. Oh, yeah. I know. I've been like, yeah. sorry, this is <laughs> off up. I've been using the phone to detect they're what words. They're so loud. <laughs> <laughs> really yeah. lovely though. Yes, it is actually. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, well, let's go for question two then from um, Yorania Davis, who asks how long the IgG needs to be present in order for us to consider a patient immune. We have no idea. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, we're really trying, uh, well, not me in particular, but scientists are really trying hard to figure out um, if one, does it, is there a difference with how much IgG antibodies you're producing? Does it matter if the IgG antibodies are neutralizing or not? And also, the antibodies do seem to decrease over time. And so because this is a recent situation, we don't have the samples necessary to kind of answer that question. And so if someone's been infected in February, it's only been, what, three months? And yeah. so we can't really predict what their immune system is gonna do in the next six months. Um, but based on other um, infections that are similar to SARS-CoV-2, like SARS and MERS, um, immunity seems to be around a year or two. So scientists are kind of going off of that. But once again, we're still unsure. That's great. Well, um, we'll move on to question three then from uh, Joanne Gensert. Uh, he asks about subtypes of IgGs. Yes, yeah, like, so talk a little bit about those. Yeah, <laughs> um, so you're getting really nitty gritty. Um, so they are, um, I think, four subtypes of IgG. The authors do not indicate what subtypes they are. I briefly read something. Um, no, I think that was something else. I'm not sure if I've read a paper that specify the subtype of IgG that they're looking at. It may be in the new paper um, that Rockefeller University put out because they actually did a sequence analysis of all the antibodies that are produced. And I'm pretty sure they might have a better idea of what those subtypes of IgG are. Um, so there are clonal differences with the, the IgG antibodies that are produced. And these clonal differences do seem to have a connection with how good they are at neutralizing infection. But that's a good question. All right, cool. I think related maybe is uh, Joanne asks again, was there a correlation between the different seroconversion times, I think, mm -hmm. and the deaths versus survival or release from the hospital? And that's an interesting question because we didn't actually see uh, some correlation. Samples. Yeah. Um, so from the paper, I don't think they, I don't think any of the patients succumb to infection. Um, 
So I don't know the answer to that. So they did not follow the patients after they're released from the hospitals. So I can't, I can't actually answer that question based on what the authors presented. Yeah. 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 This is an important question. And I think, yeah. you know, folks are on it and hopefully we'll get more data. Uh, to give a bigger picture of that later on. Okay, that's great. And um, Aditi is back with another question, uh, question five for today. She asks if the IgG antibodies are specific to spike proteins or if they're just a general response to the virus. That's a really good question. Yeah, that is a good question. Um, so with the IgG antibody, so in this particular test, the assay that they use, the antigen that they use to detect the IgG and IgM antibodies is an antigen that has both um, parts of the spike protein and parts of the nuclear protein. Um, and so it, they're kind of like lumping them in one. Um, studies are showing that you can get IgG antibodies response to the spike protein and the nuclear protein, but I'm unsure of the other parts of the virus. So it is specific. Um, and I'm not sure if it correlates with the different types of IgG subtypes that you're producing or clonal antibodies that you're producing. It's a good question. That's yeah, I great. think like, there's, a, there's a test um, that uh, some folks that have produced, I don't know who made this test, but there's a test that's an antibody test that's specific to the N protein, which is the nucleocapsid protein that surrounds the RNA. And then the, the one that you talked about, which is specific to yeah. the S protein. So there are some, and I think the paper addressed this a little, where they looked at um, cross-reactivity of, I think it's the N protein of both SARS-CoV-1 and SARS-CoV-2, and there seems to be slight cross-reactivity with a couple of the sample sets. So mm -hmm. the way to develop the assay to bypass any like false uh, positives, they incorporated um, a peptide that incorporates parts of the N and parts of the S, um, so they can weed out any of the false positive of antibodies that may be there from a previous SARS type infection and not the current SARS-CoV-2. Um, the test I think right now that Quest Diagnostic is using and the one that I spoke about in um, um, in my first presentation, they were using the spike protein for those antibody tests. And I think the majority that, or the few that the FDA has approved for emergency purposes do use the S protein or the spike protein for the antibody testing. Yeah, it's so weird. One of the things that I learned through this whole process is how amazing antibodies are like like i'm like oh great they developed an antibody test it never even occurred to me that to ask is this the right antibody test yeah. you know yeah. <laughs> i feel like my mind is blown through all of yeah. that no it's a lot the immune response the immune system the human body is fascinating right and then we're also combating that with a fascinating virus <laughs> and so i think it's like a catch-22 trying to yeah. understand both i know i i feel a little bit bad about the level of excitement of science I feel around something that's so destructive to humans. You know, it's just like weird yeah. balance. But the, the as a cancer, yeah. As a cancer researcher, I can definitely relate to that. Mm -hmm. yeah. Oh yeah, you, yeah, so. for sure. Great. So we have a question for Marva. Um, hey, Marva. Yeah. Hello. <laughs> I think that you're friends. <laughs> <laughs> um, can neutralizing antibodies be made in the lab? That's a really good question. So that paper that I pointed out um, in the end that Rockefeller put out about a week ago through the preprint bio archive, their goal is to somehow, or is to make these antibodies in the lab. So what they're looking at, they're looking at the different patients, they're um, looking at their antibodies, they're sequencing the antibodies that they have, and they're trying to use that sequence to produce the same antibodies that seem to have really high neutralizing capabilities. And so if we can um, pretty much replicate those really strong neutralizing antibodies that patients have produced in their immune systems, we can make more of that in the lab to use as drug targets. So that's exactly what um, scientists at Rockefeller are working on right now. So yep, you can. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's the Nuisance Swag Lab. Yeah, Nuisance right? yeah. yeah. So look up Michelle Nuisance Swag's work. Uh, they, they've been asking for people. There's a, there was a clinical study, and it might still be ongoing, that if anybody's recovered from COVID-19, they want to see what your antibodies are like so that they can mm -hmm. base therapies off of mm -hmm. the super antibody producers, right? Yeah. So it's really yeah. so all, all I mean, about they, they, coming together, you know? Yeah. It, it kind of relates to some of the sort of earlier, I don't know if people are still walk, working on that, but some of the earlier studies of people who were trying to get serum out of patients who have recover, recovered to use as therapeutic itself, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you're having patients who, and I think the thought was like, if you had really bad symptoms and you recovered, that 
there's a high likelihood that you have really good antibodies. So they were asking patients to donate their blood samples. So personally, I have um, someone close to me who had COVID-19 and her doctor asked her like, hey, can we have some of your blood so we can use your serum, um, hopefully to um, use it as a treatment for other patients. So that's the whole idea behind it. Yeah, same for me. I have a very close friend who's actually a nurse and has been working in the ICUs who ended up with COVID. And she came from this from the angle of watching firsthand people, mm -hmm. you know, suffer and many not recover from the disease. And she was like, take my blood and do everything you can with it. Mm -hmm. So I think people are really looking to, to donate in mm -hmm. under the circumstances. Yeah, it's great that people are being that active as well. Yeah. Yeah. So thank um, you to everybody who's doing that, by the way. Absolutely. Um, okay, we have another question from Joanne who asks if the uh, samples uh, were collected post-mortem and if there's a tissue bank of these samples. Post-mortem meaning after they... I think on patients that died from COVID. Or um, so not all... in this paper. Okay. Um, so all of these samples were taken once they were in the hospital. So they were admitted into the hospital. I guess they signed a consent to be a part of this clinical study and they took how much ever samples they were able to take. Um, that could be one or that could be a series of three, like I mentioned. Um, but they haven't mentioned using sample sets from people who uh, passed from COVID-19. And I'm not sure if there's a tissue bank of samples. I don't know. It's a good question. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure. But all putting that together. Yeah. Oh, that's good. But all of the patients that were used in this trial were patients who survived them. Yeah, so they were all hospitalized and at some point they were all released from the hospital. Yeah. Great. Well, thank you so much for presenting. I think that's all the questions we have. Yeah, um, that's what I was checking now. Yeah, I put the, the, so there was a question around giving the link to the Rockefeller paper, so that's there. Um, and I think that's fairly, I think we're, we're pretty good. One of the things that I really loved about this paper is the power, you know, I think we, we all feel that like statistics must involve, you know, in order for us to make any kind of like real um, clinical uh, like recommendations or suggestions, it's, it requires hundreds of thousands of data points, which I think for like medications that we all, you know, we can't have a, a you know, a cold and flu medication that's specific to our bodies at this point in time. Though in cancer, we want to have individualized, yeah. right? And so this sort of this push and pull between the aggregate uh, data and understanding tr how the trends are so that we can predict what happens in a population mm -hmm. versus mm -hmm. the individual response, I think is, it's a really fascinating way to, to approach the science here. Mm -hmm. And even Absolutely. with like, if we're looking at the combined data set and the aggregate data, it's really nice because like the bioarchive paper from Rockefeller, they're pinpointing individuals who have this really high neutralizing antibody response and using that particular individual to utilize that for a population. And so I think both are very important for us to look at the population on a whole, but also if we can pinpoint someone who has like, you know, slightly outlier that we can hijack some of their mechanisms to utilize for the rest of the population. Yeah, I'm just thinking also historically when you look at outliers, um, like as an example, um, there was a set of outliers in like an island over in the South Pacific that helped us to understand like HDL metabolism, right? Mm -hmm. And and sometimes these genetic outliers are are open up doors for us to understand some new phenomenon about the human body. Mm -hmm. uh, so um, it's really good that we are taking all of this data in, and that there's people who can try to make sense of it in some way, shape, or form. And the style and the and put, applying the different styles of reasoning uh, onto a question so that there's multiple angles being explored for any specific question, I think, is really important as well. And the, and the fact that it's, you know, as you mentioned earlier, such uh, a strong collaborative effort involving different hospitals and everything, which is such an important part of science. Yeah. Um, any last words, uh, Odellis, to share about the paper or anything like this? Um, no, I don't have any other comments or questions. Um, so there is one, actually one more question from Facebook and it's around IgMs versus, I guess it's maybe IgMs and I'm, I'm assuming it's in the context of IgM versus IgG. It says mm -hmm. here, IgMs lower, you know, and, mm -hmm. you know, and, and, and I, maybe we can talk about it from the right now. Yeah. Um, hey, Ferdy. Um, so, uh, so 
I think one of the main takeaways is that IgM seems to be maybe important for triggering the response for IgG. I don't know if there's a way that we can prevent the lowering or if that would help. Because even when IgG, IgM is lowered, you're still getting production of IgG. And I think the important takeaway is that we want the IgG levels. Um, and it doesn't seem to be that IgM may be that important for like, you know, combating this infection well. And that's just me thinking about all the other papers that I've read. Um, maybe scientists are realizing that it does have another role to play, um, but I'm not sure.